Ball game over already, huh? What? Ball game over already? I didn't know. I enjoyed this more too. <laughs> Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming back. It's always a question when you start a new class, you have the first class, if anybody's going to come back for the next one. So thank you for coming back. And let's pray and we'll get started. God, we thank you for tonight, for the blessings you give us. Thank you for this class, for the opportunity to study uh, something that's mentioned many, many times in Scripture. And Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit is here guiding our discussion, taking us where you want us to go, helping us learn those things you want us to learn so that we can follow you and be the people you want us to be. Thank you for blessing us as you do in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we just did sort of an introductory class to angels and demons. We're going to do a little more of that tonight, getting some into some scriptures, looking at demons, and instead of just asking you what your thoughts and remembrances are, actually looking into uh, some biblical examples of angels to, to really still give us an overview of what we're going to be studying. I mentioned the book, This Present Darkness, last week. If you can get a copy of that, John says there's a couple of copies at Kay's Bookstore, which is that used bookstore on North Road. Uh, so you might find some, some there. Um, it's an interesting read. Again, do it or not, your, your call. Uh, but it's a fictional story about angels and demons fighting each other and how that interacts with humanity. And when I read it 35, 40 years ago, it really impressed on me the idea that there's a spiritual war going on around us because I don't know that I'd ever paid much attention to it uh, by the mid-80s. I was 40 years old by then. Uh, but don't know that I'd paid much attention to the, the world around us and what's going on in the atmosphere around us uh, that we as Christians tend to totally ignore. Uh, so the storyline of the book as I mentioned last week, is that the angels and the demons are, in essence, fighting each other, and that our prayers and our commitment and devotion to God strengthens the angels so that they can defeat the demons. And when we stop praying and we stop being devoted to God, they lose some of that power, and the demons start winning. Uh, and we can see that in the history of the world as nations who were originally Christian, biblically oriented, seem to do quite well as they get started. And you wonder, a country like America, we didn't have any right to defeat England. We didn't have any right to win our independence from the most powerful nation on the face of the earth at that time. Uh, but we did. I give God all the credit. And for a long, long time, our nation was focused on, to some extent, obviously not everything, God. We had many more Christians than we do percentage-wise today, and we can see our nation going in a way most of us probably just as soon as not go. The same was true in Europe, as many of those European nations started under the guise of Christianity and slowly turned away from it, and we watched those nations go off their own direction as well. So to me, that story sort of makes sense. Uh, and it goes along with the verse we looked at last week, Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For we struck, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. If that's true, then we need to be aware of what's going on around us so we can get ready for the battle. We can fight the spiritual things that are around us and have something uh, good to do about it. We asked last week, what were some of your understandings of angels? Now, let me just go over a few. Some of these were listed, some maybe not have been. We don't become angels when we die. Christians... Believers in God do not die and become angels. 
angels are already created. Our souls go to heaven. God gives us a new body. What that's going to look like, I'm not really sure. But we remain God's created human spiritual people when we get to heaven. We do not turn into angels. Angels are already here. Uh, there's no evidence that angels have halos. You know, every time you see an angel, if you're looking at one in a picture, it's almost always got a halo. If you do a Christmas story, the kid's always got a halo. Where does that come from? It is a good question. Where does that come from? Come on. Think. Any art majors art. in here? Art. It comes from any, art. If you think about the Renaissance period, when all the, the artistry was going on, the huge chapel that were being built, all the angel angelic beings all have this beautiful golden umbrella above their head. And it's a sign of their spiritualness, I guess. Uh, and it's from that, we just picked up the idea angels must have halos, and so we give them all halos. But there's nothing in the Bible that indicates in any way in the world that angels have halos. Angels can appear in different forms to people, and we'll look at some of those uh, this evening. And we touched on some of that last week. We looked at this verse. It says, keep on loving one another as, as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For in doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. If you ever need a reason to be nice to people you don't know who come into your life, this verse is it. Because you really don't know, we really don't know, who's an angel and who's not. And this isn't just somebody you call your angel or whatever. These are honest to goodness, I think the Bible teaches, angels who appear as humans. And I, for one, would not want to be rude and inhospitable to an angel that happens to encounter me. Uh, so if you can't think of any better reason, here's one. Be nice to people. Be kind. Uh, don't go crazy when bad things happen. Uh, they're sent to minister to us. And we looked at this verse last week as well, I think. The Hebrew writer says, Are not all angels, ministering spirits, sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Angels have as part of their task to help us, to minister to us. I suggested last week and somewhere in the midst of this class, not tonight, but in this class overall, we'll take the opportunity for those of you who would like to, to share some of those experiences that you've had, where as you look back at those circumstances, you're thinking there's no way in the world I should still be here were it not for God intervening in my life. Or even if it's not death you're thinking about, some other circumstance in your life, that were it not for God doing something to protect me, I've been in prison for the rest of my life. Or I, who knows what? Uh, be thinking about that as we carry on through this class. When might you have encountered with an angel? What might have happened in your life where looking back at it you could see you know, that might have been an angel. Might have been a minister from God who came down here to help me. The Bible does not say that all of us have a guardian angel. I think a lot of people teach that. A lot of people suggest that. If you listen to some of the New Age people, they want you to pray to your angel. They want you to channel into them. They want you to pray that they would reveal their name to you so that you can call them by name and have this relationship with them that the Bible never says anything about. There isn't any indication that all of us have a guardian angel whose primary job is to take care of us. Uh, we looked, I think, last week at the passage in Matthew where the little children were being kept from Jesus, and he said, hey, let them come unto me, for their angels are always before the face of God. You can interpret that in different ways, but there's no other passage around that really says every one of us has a guardian angel. Don't let that bum you out. There are plenty of angels out there to take care of us. There are plenty of angels to minister to us as God wants them to minister. Whether you have a guardian angel and you can figure its name out or not doesn't really matter. We have angels who are around us 
who God will use to take care of us. Any other thoughts about angels? Any other points we made last week that you want to revisit or throw out or ask about or whatever? Anybody? All right. For those of you who are new, we're always open to comments. You got something to say? Pin it out. If you want to raise your hand first and get attention, that's okay too. Or if you just want to say, excuse me, whatever you want to do, we're always open to your comments and things you need to say. <clears throat> Similarly, we talked a little bit about demons last week. They serve Satan. You know, their, their boss, if you want to look at it that way and the way we view things, is him. It's Lucifer. It's Satan. It's Beelzebub. It's some other names like that that are referenced. The demons serve him. He rebelled and took a bunch of angels with him in from heaven. Uh, he's their boss. They can possess people. You can't read through the New Testament without realizing demons can get a hold of people. Some of us, I believe, have encountered people who were possessed by demons. And we'll share some of those stories as we get on into the class. They can cause physical harm. They can cause mental harm. They are not very nice creatures. Their whole purpose in life is to draw people away from God. That's all they're here for. And they will do that any way they can. They will tempt you. They will mess with you. They will play with your mind. They will make you have things happen to you to take you away from God where you'll just give up on God thinking why is God letting this happen to me if they can do that to you they win don't ever allow your circumstances in life to pull you away from God God doesn't do things to harm us but he permits things in this world to go on demons have free will just like you and I do they can choose how to act what to do, who to attack. Be real careful. Uh, when you encounter things that are tough, you may be fighting against a demon. They can bind unbelievers so they can't see the light of the gospel. They cannot take hold of us. If you're a child of God and you've got the Spirit of God living in you, demons aren't strong enough to push the Spirit of God out. They cannot, I do not believe, possess people who are Christians. Now, they can still do nasty things to you. They can put people in your lives and circumstances in your lives to mess your life up. But they cannot possess you the way we see demon possession going on in the Bible because we've got the Spirit of God living in us. And they can't move him out. But they can do all kinds of things to mess our lives up. They can torment us. They can cause all things to happen. They can, as I said, send people into your life to mess your life up. They can cause you all kinds of heartache. They can just be worse than a two-year-old. And you just got to fight them off and resist them and stand up against them. Um, they promote false doctrine and perform signs to deceive people. You can read all kinds of stuff that people believe today that's not contained in God's holy word. Uh, Paul showed me something before class started. Uh, a list of angels and the definitions of them and their names. That is not biblical. People have come up with all kinds of stories and all kinds of things they want to throw out there for us to believe. You need to be careful that you test every spiritual doctrine against God's word. Don't believe somebody just because they say, well, I was doing this and this happened. It must have been God. Well, maybe it was God. Maybe it wasn't. Uh, and if it conflicts with what the Bible says, I can assure you it wasn't God. When one of his angels doing whatever it was you encountered, and that only leaves one other option. And so be real careful when people come to you and share things to you, spiritual things that they want you to believe, that aren't in Scripture. It may be somebody trying to draw you away from God. And as I said a while ago, one of the, I don't know if it's as popular as it was 10, 15 years ago, 
but a movement to, to learn who your angel is so you can pray to your angel. So you can learn your angel's name. For the longest time, that was what they wanted you to do. Pray that your angel will reveal his name to you. So you can call him by name. There is nothing in the Bible that suggests we should do that. Paul. Well, even in some cases, when even the minister, because they're a certain religion, they don't accept other people. Sure. You know, but Jewish people didn't accept you know, the, the Gentiles and so on. And you know, there's other countries and so on. If you're in there, they don't accept you know, what you believe in. And you know, you a little bit different type of thing. So. I have no doubt one of Satan's biggest victories is the prejudice we have in this world. And they don't all have to be church people. Whites don't like blacks. Blacks don't like, like whites. The Americans don't like Japanese. You know, nobody likes the Muslims. You know, I guess we can go on and on and on of challenges you and I have to face every day because we live in a fallen world. We live in a world where evil abounds. Jesus says Satan is the prince of this world. For a while he's going to be able to go run amok all he wants to. And one of the biggest things I think he's accomplished is things just like that. Jews don't like Gentiles. Protestants don't like Catholics. Democrats don't like Republicans. Whatever they are, we are just at odds with each other and all that really accomplishes is strife, a lack of peace, the inability for us to go to certain families of people and tell them about Jesus. Because I don't want to. I don't want those people in my church. I don't want those people sitting next to me. And on and on we go. Absolutely right. We need to be real careful when you are being told by somebody you need to not like those people because they're yucky. You need to stop for a minute and say, where's that coming from? Because Jesus only died for white people, right? No, no of course not. Jesus died for everybody. Doesn't matter what color their skin is. Doesn't matter what sex they are. Doesn't matter what nation they're from. Jesus died for all of us. He didn't start out a white American. You know, he lived in the Middle East. He was Jewish. He was probably dark-skinned and dark hair, in spite of what all the pictures show that we have hanging around in our houses. So if we're going to judge people based on what they look like, what their skin color is, what country they're from, what language they speak, we better be real careful because all we're doing is allowing Satan to come in and, and create division where God doesn't want division. He will promote all kinds of things. He can do miracles. People who follow Satan can do miracles just like God can. How do we know that? Well, some of them are rich. That doesn't make them a miracle worker. How do we know that? Where in the Bible do we know that followers of Satan can work miracles? Plagues. Yeah, the plagues. Remember the problem in Egypt when God sends Moses to the Pharaoh and he has all these first three or four miracles and Moses does it and Pharaoh's magicians say, what's the big deal? We can do that too. And they do. Where do you think they got that power from? It wasn't a sleight of hand. It came from Satan. Satan enables them to have power. And Satan, I don't think, has lost any of his power any more than the Holy Spirit has lost any of his power since Christ was here. So they can go around causing trouble for us today and they can deceive people into believing certain things because of the way they act and the way they teach and the things that they can do. Again, be careful. If you're watching something unfold and you're not sure where it's coming from, get into the Word. Pray to God. Don't just believe things because your eyes see something you think, wow, a miracle worker must be from God. And not necessarily. Test what they're teaching you. And if they're teaching you something wrong, we've got a problem. They're going to end up in hell. You know, that's one thing we can be assured of. Matthew 25 says, Then he says to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, 
prepared for the devil and his angels. You know hell wasn't created for us. God didn't make hell so that he could send us there. He created it for the devil and his angels. It was created long before you and I ever got on this earth. Because when the angels rebelled against God, he at that very moment decided what their fate was going to be. And he prepared a place where they were going to spend eternity. Some of us, hopefully no one in this room, I say us in the more broad scope, will end up there. Because we'll follow Satan instead of God. But God doesn't want us there. God wants us saved. God wants us in heaven. He doesn't want you and me or anybody else to go to hell. He wants us following Jesus Christ. Sadly, millions upon millions upon billions of people will choose to follow Satan. And they'll end up more Satan. Do you think there's any opportunity for the followers of Satan, you know, his angels, to change? There is no opportunity for Satan's angels to change. And we're going to cover that in a class. Satan's angels have already had their fate determined. You and I, and any living human who's got their mental faculties still in effect, can always change and join God until the day they die. Isn't that nice to know? Even if you're not a child of God, you're not stuck there. You can always come to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. The devil and his angels don't have that opportunity. Their fate is sealed. Which, we, you know, someone asked the other day, we were having a conversation. Is God still creating angels or can angels still sin? I don't know for sure about whether they can still sin or not. The Bible doesn't say one way or the other, so I'm not going to throw my answer out there. But the ones who have sinned, they're done. Now as we study scripture and we see that these angels that are with God are still ministering to us, they're doing God's will. We looked a little bit last week, we'll do some more tonight. What are they doing? They're doing God's will. Maybe somewhere after Satan and the angels rebelled, God blocked to where the angels don't have that free will anymore. I don't know that. The okay? Bible doesn't say that. So are angels still choosing not to follow God and God's throwing them out? It's possible. But the key point is, those who are on God's side are ministering to us. Those who are on Satan's side will do everything they can to stop us from living the way God wants us to live. They can appear as Christians. I think we looked at this verse last week. Paul is writing about Satan. He says, no wonder for Satan himself. He's talking about the no wonder people are doing things they shouldn't be doing. No wonder, he says, Satan himself can masquerade as an angel of light. In other words, he can still appear as an angel of God. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. In other words, some people who follow Satan can appear as Christians. They can sit in church with us. They can be lovey-dovey, sweet as can be, and the next thing you know, they've wormed their way in and created problems. Or they've dragged people away from God. Or they've taught things that aren't true. Many people stand in the pulpit Sunday after Sunday after Sunday preaching lies. They don't teach the Bible. They teach what their denomination tells them to preach. They preach what they want the Bible to say. They preach all kinds of stuff that doesn't coincide with what the Bible says. I do not say those people are Satan's servants, but he's got a hold of them to some extent where they're teaching things they shouldn't be teaching. Some of them may very well be the people Paul's writing about. They're servants of Satan who are masquerading as children of light. They're in our churches. They're doing things they shouldn't be doing. Angels, demons were cast from heaven. The Bible tells us that. Ezekiel talks about it. Revelation talks about it. That when Satan rebelled and took the angels with him, those that rebelled, 
God threw them out of heaven. They're not up there anymore as we think of heaven. They're down here creating havoc for us. Thank you very much. Uh, a real problem. We need to just be careful. Questions about any of that? Thoughts? Well, just speculation. Uh, reverse of it. I wonder if <coughs> angels can pose. I don't know how to put this. And <coughs> demons, in order to get the demons to be on their side, or not to do something bad. I don't think angels can appear as demons because demons would be evil. They would be wrong. Uh, I don't know that an angel would want to appear as a demon, would want to act like one of Satan's followers to try to get Satan's followers to do what's right. I, I don't see that because angels, they don't get a chance to repent. The angels who followed Satan don't get to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, save me. That's not going to happen for them. And again, that's the way God designed that. When they rebelled in heaven and God threw them out, there is no indication anywhere that they have a chance to repent and come back to God. The word I misspelled, either in this class last Monday, or the last Monday when I wrote shutters that the, the angels, demons, believe and shudder. S-H-U-D-D-E-R, not T-T-E-R, like I wrote. Again, feel free to correct me if I mess something like that up on the board. I don't like to have a misspelling on the board. Feel free to say, Bob, that's not spelled right. And then we can argue about it. Uh, but certainly it's shudders, not shudders. So if the demons believe and shudder with a D, they're going to hell. They can't repent. They can't change sides. God prepared hell for them. They don't get to come back. They don't get to choose and say, oops, messed up that one. I come back. God doesn't let them come back. They're done. We have a chance to repent as long as we're breathing. You can say to God, I accept Christ as my Savior. You can repent of your sins. You can go to God as long as you're alive and thinking. Angels who rebelled can't do that. They're lost. Why God did it that way, I have no clue. One of our mottos for the Wednesday night class, which maybe we can make it a Monday night class motto, is God is God and we're not. God gets to do things because he's God. And we may look at some of them and think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, too bad. Nobody said God had to make sense to me. He's God. We're not. He makes the rules. Our job is to figure out what those rules are and follow them to the best of our ability. So thinking of angels, can you think of some angels in some Bible stories that are familiar to you? Christmas story. Say again? Christ doomed. Okay, when Jesus rose from the grave, angels showed up. They were talking to the people who showed up at the tomb. Absolutely. Right? Christmas story. That Christmas story. The end of Jesus' life, beginning of Jesus' life. The angels proclaim the birth of Jesus. What else? The Daniel story of the angel trying to get to Daniel when he's praying. Daniel's chapter 8, 9, and 10 is Daniel's praying. The angel finally shows up and says, I've been trying to get here ever since you started praying, but I got delayed by this prince of Persia. Finally had to call Michael to get some help. What else? The angel in the burning bush. Okay, there's an angel in the bush that's talking to Moses. Moses sees this bush on fire comes over to see what on earth is going on because it's not burning up. It's just got flames popping out of it. That'd be sort of weird. And he does, and the angel speaks to him. What else? Who shut the lion's mouth? An angel. An angel does. When Daniel gets saved in the lion's den and Nebuchadnezzar comes to get him out, he says, hey, not to worry, an angel from God shut the mouth of those lions and they couldn't harm me. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember, they have someone that appears as a son of God in the fiery furnace with them. Most people presume that's an angel as opposed to God himself. What else? What happens in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve get kicked out? Angels are stationed at the entrance. Yeah. Angel shows up. God puts an angel at the entrance to the garden. So they can't get in and eat from the tree of life. There are all kinds of instances uh, of those. The garden, Hagar. Remember Hagar? Who's Hagar? That was um, uh, Abraham's concubine. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Handmaid. Yes. Sarah's handmaid who becomes Abraham's concubine. Uh, she encounters an angel. When she gets thrown out, when Sarah says, Fooey on you, I don't want you here anymore, an angel from God appears to her. Remember the angels show up with Lot when God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels show up and say, Lot, get your family and get out of here. Well, didn't they protect his house too? When the they, angels... drive, yeah, they make the people go blind <coughs> who were trying to get the angels out of Lot's home. Uh, but they show up in that picture. They appear to Daniel, as we've already talked about. They appear to Zechariah. If you've never read the book of Zechariah, angels are all through the book of Zechariah, giving him message after message after message that God wanted him to write. Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, who this one should have been, also has an angel show up, right? And says to him, you're going to have a child. And he says... Not only have my chinny chin chin, I'm too old for that. And so the angel says, because you don't believe, you'll be a mute until the child is born. And so he shows up. Angel shows up to Mary and Joseph too, right? Mm -hmm. There's angels all over the place. Angels, as we've already stated, uh, show up for the shepherds. Uh, there's all kinds of angels in the Bible, and we're going to look at more of those as we go through. But as we get into this study I just wanted to make sure we're understanding this is a something in the Bible that is all through the pages of scripture we don't pay much of it, much attention to them I would suspect mainly part of it and I'm just guessing at this maybe you do pay a lot of attention to angels the stories that have angels in them have become so familiar to us that they no longer wow us Oh, yeah, an angel showed up and protected Daniel. Good deal. Yeah, we don't think about those things much anymore. The Jesus stories, we just, you know, we know the angels are there, but it's like they don't make a whole lot of difference to us anymore. I hope by the time this class is over, we will be paying a whole lot more of attention to the spiritual world around us. Rosalind. I read somewhere Satan's biggest lie was to convince us that he doesn't exist. Absolutely and right. I wonder if that has filtered into if he doesn't exist, angels don't exist either. I'm sure it not. does. I, I have no doubt that Satan has convinced many, many people there is no spiritual world at all. There is no Satan, so there's probably no angels. There's no good angels or bad angels. And if Satan can get us believing that, the next step is there's no spiritual world at all, so there is no God either. Uh, and so why do we care about any of that stuff? Let's just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. Uh, I, I do believe that's one of Satan's biggest weapons is to convince people he doesn't exist. All these bad things that happen are just fate or luck or bad luck or sorry for you or whatever. Uh, but there is no Satan. Yeah, I think that's a real problem for us. Uh, and sometimes even as Christians, I think, we sort of push him out of our mind and we act like he's not there. We sort of ignore him and then he blindsides us. And we're thinking, how did I end up in this mess? Because I wasn't on guard against those who might come against me to take me away from God. It was the strangest, strangest appearance of angels on December 25th. The strangest appearance? The angel choir that Jesus is born. A host of, heaven, of, of the heavenly host show up. I have no doubt those are angels. Not only does the angel show up and talk to the shepherds, but then a whole host of heavenly beings appear. That's why we have choir singing at Christmas time, right? Because the angels had a choir to sing at Christmas time. 
And so many, many churches, including ours, will have a choir at Christmas time and we'll sing some Christmas songs. I don't know that that's why we do that, but it's still, but it fits the story, doesn't it? It fits the story. Well, that's the important part. part is they did it. They did it. Whether or not we do, it's not that important. Sometimes it's not. But they are proclaiming the birth of Jesus. We need to be proclaiming the birth of Jesus. Not just at Christmas time. We need to do that all year long. We need to be telling people that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. All the time. Not just Christmas, not just Easter. But regularly. Other thoughts or comments about angels and demons in the Bible? Paul. Well, you know, to me, a good example of one of the... Uh the demons of the Jewish people. You go back and uh, when you, you watch those older people in here, we watched TV back in the 50s and 60s. You used to see you know, crimes and so on without being punished. There was sex, no sex or anything like that. And now you watch TV, and there's all kinds of things that are not against the Bible and so on. Yeah, I think we talked last week about how if Satan was to show up with horns and a tail, all bright red, carrying a pitchfork, and said, hey, do this, every one of us would say, no way are we going to do that. But if he appears as a professional sports figure, or some Hollywood star, or some politician, or someone else we were taught to admire <coughs> as we grew up, and he says, hey, how about trying this? It's a whole lot more believable that we would do that then. Some of us in here are old enough to remember the, the movie that shocked America's conscience. What was it? Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Gone Wind. With what, what was the horrible thing said? Damn. Damn. <laughs> Frankly, whatever her name was. Charlotte. 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 I, Charlotte. Don't, Charlotte. I don't, I don't give, give a damn. damn. And <laughs> they wanted to censor that because we don't talk that way in polite company. Well, that was just the opening of the floodgates, like you say, Paul. And they pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. To where now, you can see full frontal nudity on regular television. I mean, it's just crazy. Because Satan gives, takes an itch, and before you know it, he's got 38 miles. And, and we just keep allowing that stuff. And because, as much as I hate to say it, as Christians, don't turn our televisions off. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse. If we're going to watch that stuff and go to those movies and do all that kind of thing. And buy the products that are advertised. And buy the products that are advertised. And support financially those things that we know are not right. We're sort of at fault for allowing some of this stuff to happen. Enablers. We are enablers. And we need to be careful that we don't do those things that are supporting things that are clearly not biblical, not in support of God. And even as I say that, people are going to think, well, what are you trying to do, censor what I can watch? You can't tell me what I can watch and what I can't watch. And I can't. You watch whatever you want to watch. I started to say I don't care what you watch. That's not true. You can watch whatever you want to watch, read whatever you want to read, do whatever you want to do. You don't have to please me. But you got a God up there who's watching us do this stuff. He's the guy we should be trying to please. And it's so easy to think, well, nothing wrong with that. What's the harm in this? And before you know it, as Paul just said, you've gone step by step by step until you've got to a spot and you look back and think, how did I ever get here? And you go step by step by step and got there. Yeah. And so we need to be careful in doing things that we're not headed in the wrong direction. Because Satan will make it look very attractive. He will make it look totally innocent. And next thing you know, you're in big, big trouble. Well, we're going to study angelology. They're a neat, a bunch of old, and I think I put these on your handout. Anybody, everybody got a handout? <laughs> big, long words. Uh, angelology is in there toward the bottom. Uh, if you ever wonder what some of these words are, uh, there's a list of them for you. A lot of theologians. I like to use these big words because it makes us look smart and intelligent and like we know something you don't. You know, I try never to use big words like this. But here's a list of some that you may hear or read. 
And you may be wondering, what on earth are they talking about? Well, if you've got that list and look at it and figure out what it is, uh, you'll know what they're talking about. Angelology. What is angelology? Study of angels. Very good. It's a study of angels. As we move through this class, we're going to talk about them. The words that we think about it, angelology, or logi is the actual word. Melech is the Hebrew word for angel. And so when you see angel in the Old Testament, most of which is written in Hebrew, the word is melek, M-E-L apostrophe A-K. In Greek, the word is angelos. Oh, Los Angeles. What do you think? That's, what's the, the name of it? Yeah, it's a city, city of angels. And they get that from this biblical word. Uh, it's the city of angels, Los Angeles. The other end of the word is ology or logi, which is from the Greek, I mean, the Hebrew word of logian or the Greek word logos. What does that word mean? It means all, one, it means a scientific bunch of information about something. The word itself actually means word. Jesus Christ is the logos. When you read John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word that's there is logos, which is from logi. And so when you think of that word, Jesus is the word of God. And so angelology, or all those other ologies on your paper, are words about whatever it is they're describing. It also includes the idea, it's a scientific or a study of whatever that word, that topic is, but it's really what words are about this item that we're talking about. I think we mentioned last week, I think I said 300 times, it's actually the word angel, either in the Old or New Testament, is listed or mentioned 400 times. And again, like we said last week, if something's mentioned that often in the Bible, maybe it's something we need to pay attention to. You know, if God thought it was important enough to talk about angels 400 different times, that maybe we should be looking at these things and see what's going on. The word logos, or the Hebrew logian, is 339 times in the Bible. So again, it's something that's referenced a lot. So maybe tying those things together is something you and I uh, should be paying more attention to than what we have been paying attention to. Just a couple of, of examples, some of these we've talked about already. Uh, Gen Genesis chapter 16 is the Hagar story, where the angel comes to Hagar and says, you're going to be okay, God's going to bless you, God's going to make a great nation out of your son as well. And so we get them pretty early in the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, we know that God sends an angel to John. And John encounters many different angels in the book of Revelation. If you're with us on Wednesday night, uh, we'll cover some of those and look at some of those things um, that they send angels to him. In Genesis 3, we touched that one already. After Adam and Eve were taken out of the garden, an angel is put at the gate. Where is that garden of Eden now? Is the angel still guarding the gate? Huh? No, because the tree of life is in heaven. That's right. So we don't have to worry about people on earth finding the tree of life. What did that morph into in folklore? The tree of life? Yeah. Uh -huh. What was this, the Gama and Soto and all those guys searching for? Oh, fountain of Youth. Fountain of Youth. Absolutely. The Fountain of Youth. Come on, get some history people in here. They, it's the whole idea. They were looking for the Fountain of Youth. They thought if we can find this pool of water, we can drink it, and we'll live forever. Well, what do you think that comes from? It comes from the Bible idea that there is a tree of life, that if you had eaten from that tree of life, you would never die. Same idea there. But the revelation, again, for those of us on Wednesday, we're going to find out that the tree of life, according to John's vision, is in heaven. 
isn't on earth here anymore. There's no angel, I don't believe, guarding the gate. Personally, I don't even believe the garden of Eden exists anymore. It's been destroyed. My personal opinion, it's under the Persian Gulf. But that's just me. Uh, because if you read about where it was and you see what the world looks like today, that's about where it's at. It's been buried by water. And that's, again, my opinion. The Bible doesn't say that. Take that for what it's worth. So why are we studying angelology? been mentioned in the Bible before. <laughs> you know, right off the bat, I've got a student that's paying attention. How cool is that? Doesn't that make us all feel good? It's mentioned 400 times. Why wouldn't we want to know what the Bible says about it? Let's enjoy this journey through the scriptures and see what does God have to say. A couple of other reasons beyond that one, and that's the major theme. It is a major theme in the Bible. Angels are everywhere from the beginning to the end. There's angels stuck in so many of the stories that we know, and they're engaged in many, many of the stories that we probably aren't aware of, but by the time this class is over, you will be aware of. And so we're going to learn a whole bunch of Bible in a Bible study class. How cool is that? Huh, what a strange thing to do. Uh, it's going to raise, as part of that, a proper awareness of their roles. What do angels do? How do they act? What's their function? How do we interact with them? What's their role and how can I be aware of that? And the flip side of that is we're going to dispel, I hope, a bunch of cultural myths such as we all have a guardian angel or we need to know their names and all that kind of stuff. We're going to, as we go through the scripture, we will dispel some of the myths that we've probably learned and maybe thought nothing about except that's just the way it is. Uh, we're going to see that some of those probably aren't true. And we'll talk a little bit about where did they come from and why do we understand them the way we do. I hope we'll then appreciate more the breadth of God's creation. Most of us live in the world we can see. The things that bother us the most, the same things that drive us the most, the things that we're spending 99.9% .9 of our time making sure of, is this world we see. The material world that we're a part of. By the time we're done with this study, I hope, you'll be aware that what we see right here is a minuscule amount of what's going on around us. And we will be amazed, I hope, at what's going on in this world that we don't see and that many times we don't even pay any attention to. I hope we'll have a better grasp of the battle between good and evil. Again, that's the, po the point of that book, This Present Darkness. It's the battle that's going on in the spiritual realm. And they're after one thing, and that's your soul. Their soul, S-O-L-E, purpose, is to get your S-O-U-L, soul. And we need to be on guard. We need to be aware that they are after you. They don't want you going to heaven. They don't want you following God. They don't want you praising Him. They want to play with your life in such a way that we decide, I'm not going to worship God anymore. I'm not going to praise God anymore. I'm going to make wrong choices because I like those choices. We need to be aware, I think, the more we are aware that there is a spiritual battle going on around us will help us, I hope, say no to things we should say no to. And when Satan tempts us, we're aware. Uh -uh, I ain't playing that game with you. Jim? I was just going to say that the demon's biggest power is the power of deception. I think that's correct. I think you're absolutely right. The demon's <coughs> biggest power, strongest power, is the power of deception. They're trying to deceive you and me into believing that what they're trying to get us to do is good for us. Nothing they want us to do will be good for us in the long run. They may fool you by giving you some pleasure for a moment, but what they're doing, they're doing that to take control of your thoughts. And remember Moses, when he left Egypt, there's a line in the Bible somewhere that says, Rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, he left Pharaoh's house. 
we need to be careful when we get tempted to enjoy sin for a season. When we think, eh, I can play with this for a little while, no, no harm done, I can quit anytime I want. You ever been doing something and I can quit anytime I want? And the truth of the matter is, you couldn't quit to save your life because it's got such a hold on you. You need help. You need parents. You need loved ones. You need counselors. You need God to help you overcome some of these things because Satan keeps telling you, what's the big deal? It's no harm. It's a victimless crime. It's all these things. That no, no problem. Do what you want to do. That's the world we live in today. Do what you want to do. And if somebody tells you you can't, get offended and scream <coughs> bloody murder. If that's the world we're in today. If you dare stand up for what's right, they're jumping all over you like you're a bigot and you're prejudiced and who knows what else. That's Satan who's manipulating the world in which we live. Um, angels, I hope, as we learn more about them, will accept that God wants us to be comfortable and have assurance. And I don't mean comfortable in the sense that he's going to give you stuff to make your life easy. But I should be at comfort. I should believe that God's got my best interest at heart. And he's got angels out there helping me overcome those things I shouldn't be doing. Overcoming those demons who are tempting me. I should have an assurance that God's power is stronger than anything Satan can throw at me. And if I believe that, then I can rest assured God's going to take care of me. And I can be at peace with what's going on in this world. Questions about this? Thoughts about this? All right, we're going to start next week. You can see, this is a, a long intro to things, but I, I want to make sure we're all on the same page as we jump into this. We're going to look at a number of biblical references, some we may have seen already, showing the existence of angels. We're going to look at a bunch of these. By the time this class is over, we will not have covered all 400 of them, but we will have covered a lot of them. So that you can see from Scripture, what are these angels doing? How are they interacting? What's the point of God telling us this story? And that's one of the things we will frequently ask as we look at Bible verses. What's the point of God telling us this? Why let us know that an angel was interacting with someone? What was he trying to impress upon us when he mentioned angels? Or demons when we get to them. Why are demons mentioned? Why does God bring that up? What's the point of having them in the story? And we'll talk about those as we get into some of these passages and some of these verses. Questions, thoughts, observations. I had heard this morning on the way into work, me and I touched on <laughs> deathbed confessions. Yes. I didn't know this and I had to look it up to see if there was any truth to it. But uh, LeBay, Anton LeBay, wrote the uh, Satanic Bible, and they stated on his deathbed, he said, I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to look it up, and there's a couple different versions of that, but then I'm trying to, I did what he made make a mistake about. Yeah, why, what did I mistake? Uh, yeah. That? What, that's what's where that left me. Okay. But what was your mistake? You didn't get that yeah. power. You know, when, when we talk about a deathbed confession, and the idea being that on your deathbed you can confess to God and be saved, I leave that up to God. That's God's job to decide if he's going to buy that or not. What I always say if I'm studying with someone and they bring that up, because I believe the Bible teaches we need to be baptized. If we're going to honor God, we need to do what God tells us to do. And one of the things he tells us to do is be baptized. And so when you're studying with people who have not been or don't think it's important, they will bring that up. Well, what about the thief on the cross? What about a deathbed confession? What about this? And, and you're, you'll throw in there, my dad on his deathbed accepted Jesus as a Savior. Are you trying to tell me my dad's not saved? I am not trying to tell you that. I do not take God's role in who's saved and who isn't. But I will always say in that conversation, 
that doesn't apply to you. You're not hanging on a cross about to die, and you're not on your deathbed. So even if God decides he'll save someone who accepts Jesus Christ with their last breath, that doesn't apply to you. You now know what the Bible says. And the Bible says you need to be baptized. Jesus taught when you believe in him, you need to be baptized. You can't stand before God someday and say, well, I didn't know that because we've now studied it. And so if you're going to study the Bible with us, let's accept what it says and let's just do what the Bible says. You can pull up all the strong men you want about deathbed confessions and thieves on the cross and a guy in the middle of the desert who can't find any water, but he got told the truth. Well, there's no water here. You know, next thing you know, he dies of thirst. That's not us. We're in the middle of a discussion where there's plenty of opportunity to get baptized if you want to be. So you don't get to stand before God someday and say, well, I was taught. Yeah. So I don't ever say who saved and who isn't. That's not my job. That's God's job. I trust him enough to believe he's got that figured out. But one thing he wants us to do is teach what his word says completely, correctly, to share with others what they need to do to come to Jesus. Uh, so that's what I teach. That's what I believe. But yeah, will the deathbed confessions work or not? I don't know. Uh, again, I'll leave that up to God. I hope his grace and mercy is greater than mine would be. Um, <laughs> And I, if you want to believe that, believe it. But that isn't the situation for any of us in this room. We today know, by reading scripture, Jesus says, go make disciples, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you decide baptism is not important, then you've just told Jesus, I don't care what your command was, I ain't doing it. And I'm not sure God is thrilled with that. So I want us to do what the Bible says do, then we don't have to worry about it. Okay? Anybody else? All right, let's pray and we'll go home. God, thank you again for tonight and the blessings you give us and the opportunity we've had to come together here and study this topic. And I pray as we're just barely opening the door that we are all getting more interested in what does the Bible say about angels and demons and why do we care and why should we care and that as we go through this class Father we will learn more about you about your creation about how much you love us and the provisions you've made to keep us in your arms help us as we study to be open to what your spirit wants us to learn we praise you for all that you do in Jesus name Amen Thank you, everybody. Yes.